Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful in oil country and around the world. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Good. Doing good. Hanging in there. Living my hermetic, hermetic, that's the right word, I think, lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Is that <sighs> but, uh, lies in a, like a hermit, or is that like hermetically sealed? <laughs> I think it's... Uh, it could be either. <laughs> I think it's both, actually. That's The, the root of the one is the... Is the uh, the one is the maybe root of the other? Maybe it's the same root. It's hermetically with an et mm. as opposed to an it, but it could still be herm. Could be herm. Like herm oh. Ham Hans Harrison, our mandatory 1970s sports mm. reference. I got nothing to complain about because I don't have to go out every day and face you know the public during this latest uh, COVID. Oh. Feel sorry for the uh, teachers right now, like. Yeah, you and me and my wife, a retired teacher of 40 years, has got all kinds of sympathy pains going on here. The the teachers wear it, like, all year, the ones going to school every day, like, wearing the masks, dealing with all the health precautions, like, they really have been uh, heroes of this pandemic. So, shout out to the teachers. All right, Bruce, um, Edmonton Oilers, Mm. three to one victors over the Ottawa Senators, yippee. And I mean that. I, I'm not being sarcastic. Yippee. I, I know there's a tendency, like it's just the Senators, but if we were losing the, these games, people wouldn't be feeling that way at all. Huge nine victories in a row over the Senators have, have made the difference in the Edmonton Oilers season. Yep. They have they really have looked like Ottawa has looked like it has no answer for Edmonton. All this was a night where when it came to grade A chances, Bruce, Ottawa had nine and the Oilers just had six. So Ottawa and the Ottawa had a a dominant shot share in the game as well. But Mike Smith uh, was, again, fantastic. It was fantastic, Bruce. Another another great game for Mike Smith. So So this is our two good things, two bad things and two numbers podcast. And because it's an Oilers win, and we're always feeling a little bit more talkative after a win, generally speaking, uh, we're going to go with two good things each. What is your first good thing? Yeah, uh, I'm going to single out uh, the play of Yessa Pugliarvi, uh, Oilers uh, right winger on their big unit, which was the one uh, one group that actually held their own in the flow of play tonight, according to these uh, the greens of post-game statistics we got. Uh, and Yessa did, in fact, co-lead the Oilers with his co- line mate, Connor McDavid, four shots on goal each on a night. The Oilers mustered just 23 against 40. But what I loved about his game tonight was his tremendous work work ethic. I just thought Yessa worked his butt off in this game. And he was involved in the scrums and the hits and the corner work and the puck chasing and the greasy stuff. And uh, he uh, got in the middle of another one where some guy took a run at him, number 62 on Ottawa. Clark Bishop took a run at him in the corner and Yessa saw him coming, and he put Bishop down hard, similar to the way he put uh, uh, Brady Kachuk down hard with a reverse hit in Edmonton uh, two or three games back. Yessa, I mean, he's he's big and he's strong, and he's getting stronger, and he's physically winning battles. And he's got good enough hands, you know, to fish pucks out and gain control and stuff. He doesn't have great hands. He'd have a lot more goals <laughs> than he's got if he has if he had great hands. But uh, uh, the puck does seem to go through his stick at crucial times sometimes. But boy, he he uh, he uh, sure wins his share of battles, and he sure joins his share of battles. I, I just thought tonight his effort was outstanding in this game. He played 20 <clears throat> minutes and 39 seconds, and at the very end, he was rewarded uh, with the empty net goal, where he. Uh, uh, won a loose puck in front, took it to safe ice, and popped it on uh, and into the empty net. But good thing he hit the net because he shot it from the wrong side of center, which might have had bad consequences. But he scored, so good on you, Yessa Pogliarvi. My first good thing. Uh, I just I noticed his work ethic tonight as well, Bruce, because mm-hmm. it was so damn noticeable. Partly, right. 
But it, it, what it made me think is him playing with McDavid and being given this opportunity, and, and credit to Tippett for sticking with Pulley mm-hmm. RV there. He he's er, he's earned it in his own way. He's his point scoring is unimpressive at even strength, mm-hmm. but uh, you know the now it's cliche phrase of a glue player. He's he's embodying that, doing so many little things out there to uh, to earn his keep on the ice. And and I think that his work ethic has is it's always been pretty good. I've never seen a seen an issue with that. But he's raised it. To yeah. another level, and I think he's meeting McDavid's a very intense player, and he really goes mm-hmm. for it. But I think he's he's meeting the intensity of McDavid mm-hmm. and Drysaddle when they're together. Drysaddle always he's an up and down player when it comes to energy on the team. I think it's fair to say, but when he's with McDavid, Drysaddle tends to be on an up night, and um, Puyo RV is is meeting that what they're bringing. Those two superstar players are bringing, you know, that kind of serious taking care of business, going for it that we see from those two guys, he's also adopted that mm-hmm. as his kind of standard and it yeah. bodes well for him and his career. He's, uh, he's looking, the owners look like they have a, like an interesting top six winger with, it's funny cause you know, his, he's just, he seems to be just scraping his potential still, but yep. he's already becoming someone uh, who's playing in admirable fashion. Making Chris big Mott, progress. He, he, yeah. he his positional game still needs work sometimes he's floating around in kind of the wrong spot mm-hmm. but boy does he make a beeline for those puck battles and and he doesn't uh he doesn't mess around when he gets there he's he's grinding hard and and put a little skill and a little little experience you know calm him down a little bit when those chances come and uh who knows what the upper limit is but he's already bringing things to the mcdavid line that the mcdavid line needs so good on him. He's made huge progress. I see a player there with a high hockey IQ in that he has figured out how to play with Connor McDavid, which is not an easy thing to do. So he he realizes he's not going to get a lot of passes. And when he gets the puck, he, what who he should pass it to. But at the same time, he's starting to be confident enough to make his own plays now and then. But he's going to the net hard. He, so he's figuring out, okay, here's what I can do. Go to the net hard. Get in the corner fast. Back check hard. Do these things, and he's there in the right spot to do those things. So that's why I say high hockey IQ, which I know might go against some narrative, which has developed about Puliyarvi in the past. But that's how I see him. He is a smart hockey player, and he's showing that every game that he plays um, with McDavid and Drysaddle right now. I agree that he has a high hockey IQ when he comes to training camp next fall, and we find out that he spent all summer long working on one timers. Skyping Leon for instructions as to one timers and how to get shots off quickly and, and <clears throat> I mean there's there's parts of his game that he needs to refine I guess is all I'm saying and as long as he keeps working on them his uh, his overall progress the arrow is pointing up ninth goal of the season tonight David you know it's the game number forty one so we are at the exact halfway mark of a normal season so that of course prorates to an eighteen goal season which is not too shabby for. Uh, a guy that's never played a full season in the NHL before. And doesn't get a lot of time on the power play right now. You know, he right. gets a little bit. Uh, so that's even strength production. Yes. Um, Bruce, my my good thing is related to the top line. And and they Ottawa was pretty chippy last game. And I just love the way that Dreisaitl in particular answered the bell physically. He wiped out Kachuk and Zaitsev with major hits. Just loved it. it like when Leon goes... When he goes full power forward like that, like that is impressive. And I think it's important that the other team realize that, that these guys just aren't punching bags, but they punch back. Mm-hmm. McDavid also leveled the player with a hit in the third period. You already mentioned Puli Arvi's great hit. This is what they need to do is to remind the other team, you come at us, you're mm-hmm. coming at the wrong guy. <laughs> and, and um, you know, five feet of Victoriaville, Every now and then might not might not be a bad idea. McDavid already showed that with the uh, sneaky with the elbow attack on Jesperi Kotkaniemi, which I approved of. <laughs> and and I love their physical pushback tonight. This is how you yeah. this is how you can get space in the NHL. There's different ways to get it, and you can't always count on the refs. And sometimes just come right back at them, hammer them. So good for you, Leon Dreisaitl. Yeah, well, Zaitsev's a piece of work, too. <clears throat> he had six hits in the game last night and three tonight. 
at least one time. I can't remember which oiler he got, but he got him good. And uh, Leon got, had his chance at him, and he cranked him hard. And, uh, of course, Beatty Kachuk, the, the two of them, Drysaddle and Kachuk, had a scrum last night where Kachuk, uh, Drysaddle took a poke at him, and Kachuk took uh, uh, Drysaddle to the ice and kind of rubbed his face in the ice. I remember Darnell got up and, and uh, uh, came in on... Uh, on Kachuk and and challenged him and then got into a good shouting shoving match with him didn't you know didn't take a penalty the Oilers got their power play out of that but uh, Nurse responded but uh, I think this was a message Leon not only the Ottawa Senators but also a little bit to his own teammates yeah I can look after myself too I can run over anybody with my size and speed and coordination piss me off watch out <laughs> I love it gotta say. That Brady Kachuk is a hell of a player. Oh, he's good. Uh, I yeah, have to say, like, he, <laughs> he's good. At he is. Jerk. He's not as much of a jerk as some other <laughs> well, people who may or may not share fine. the same last name. But uh, you know, I he just he just is a real power forward, Brady Kachuk. Yes, very effective hockey player. What's your second good thing, Bruce? We did tonight. Six more shots on net tonight. Six last night. Six tonight. He just brings it. Yeah. Uh, my second, I'm just going to go up the number chart from 13, and I'm going to go 14, 15, 16, which is the Oilers tonight's second line of the Edmonton Oilers. Uh, second over the boards, that was, of course, uh, Devon Shore uh, with uh, Josh Archibald and Jujar Caro. They all three played within a few ticks of 15 minutes on the night regular shift. Uh, they didn't dominate the possession the way they did last night, but uh, they didn't get dominated. I don't think they got they got uh, specifically burned for for much at the defensive end, and they uh, brought the physical game again. Two hits for Shore, four for Archibald, seven for Kara in this game. So that's just out in one line. Thirteen hits in fifteen minutes. That's bringing it. And uh, they also brought uh, the key play when the game was on the line, which was basically real hard work by Kara and Archibald. Uh, battling and banging along the boards to win the puck. Kara worked it back to the point for uh, Caleb Jones uh, uh, to uh, find a little bit of space to get a good shot through. And uh, Devin Shore went for the front of the net, made a beautiful deflection right through the five hole of uh, Anton Forsberg, who also deserves a bit of love tonight. Nice to see him actually playing in a game after all of this... Uh, uh, Gulliver's travels that he's been through in uh, 2021, and he played pretty good. But uh, that that tip from right in front went right down and through his legs, and he really had no chance. And it was just a hard-working goal from a hard-working line, and uh, uh, I, I'm really enjoying that line. They're 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 uh, uh, they're bringing it. They're all three like Archibald's a torpedo out there. Holy moly, that guy! He just makes a beeline for the opponent and loves to hit. And uh, he uh, uh, he hammered a couple of guys hard again tonight. But uh, the, I thought all three of them have been excellent on this road trip. I thought they were good in Montreal in the three-two uh, overtime loss. Uh, again, Shore scored on a beautiful setup from Kara that night. Last night, Shore hit the post on one uh, short-handed chance and nearly had another one on a break-in with Archibald and had even strength that that line played well and they're, they're just springing it. And tonight, like Tippett, his normal MO to my eye is at the beginning of the game, he rolls his lines in order. Starts with the McDavid line, goes to the dry settler, Nugent Hopkins, whoever's 2C, he goes next. And then, you know, through the bottom six. And tonight it was... Uh, that was Kara Shore and Archibald over the board second. Of course, with Ryan Nugent Hopkins out of the lineup, which we should mention after taking a bit of a hit in the head last night. Uh, and uh, Kyle Turris came in to replace him. So rightfully, I think Tippett said, OK, that's not my second line anymore. That's my third line. So that's uh, how we played it. And the boys that got promoted up the lineup and got the extra minutes, they earned their keep. Archibald's hit on the... Um... The game-winning goal was fantastic. Do you ever <laughs> Kareem, that other player, just leveled him? And, uh, you know, that started off the uh, virtuous cycle mm -hmm. that led to that goal and a beautiful well, tip by Devin Shore. hit, too, start, started, I'd say, even before that. Like, uh, the reason the puck was in, still in the Ottawa zone was Kara disrupted the earlier breakout. 
And then Archibald creamed the guy, and then Kara got the puck in the corner and worked it back to the point. A lot, a lot of good hockey went on there in a short number of seconds, and most of it was simply of the you know hard working, uh, you know fundamentally sound um, physical game. Uh, my second good thing is was involved in that winning goal. Caleb Jones, I mm-hmm. thought had his best game in some time his best game um, since he's been back in the lineup. And uh, I know that he and Bear got uh, whipped on the shot share. But when it came to grade A scoring chances, they were actually pretty good. They Mm -hmm. sawed him off. Um, Jones just made uh, one mistake and Bear uh, one mistake early in the game. It was kind of a a tricky play, popped out into the slot. And there was a chance, a very dangerous chance late in the first off the the post. But, you know, they're, they're playing that that particular play was as unlucky as anything on a certain level because the puck was bouncing around and th- these things will happen in the NHL. But I thought that Jones moved the puck well all game long with more confidence. And um, he his play on the on the winning goal was, was fantastic. This is exactly what Caleb Jones is capable of doing. Getting the puck, walking the line, finding a spot, putting it on net for a tip like that. He d- he's done that throughout his career in junior hockey and in the AHL, we saw that play a lot. So he's got to make that play in the NHL. That's his bread and butter, and he did it. So, uh, and it was at a, obviously a crucial moment of the game. Paid off big with a goal. He he, goal. he he has been, he hasn't been the player that I've remembered, Bruce, this year. Um, he, you know, he kind of got off on, on a bad footing with COVID. He had COVID earlier this year and had to miss some parts of training camp. That's never good. You're so you're behind the eight ball, and then he he got a little. There was lots of defensemen there. Slater Cuckoo was playing okay, so he just he got in the coach's bad book. So there's just simply other other players who are more reliable. So he's he's got a long way to go in terms of earning his way back into the coach's good books. But that's the kind of play that'll get him there. That's for sure. Yeah. That's the kind of play that gets you in the next game. That's for sure. And having a pretty he didn't have a clean sheet on defense. But I thought he had a he had a sound defensive game. They didn't give up. They weren't making the bad pinches like some defensemen were that led to grade A chances against. And um, that's to their credit. That's that's one of the things they had to cut down on both of those guys. And they didn't do that tonight. So uh, I like this. Yeah, they game. struggled in Montreal and then they they bounced back. And of course, Ottawa is not a strong team as Montreal. So and for a third pairing, that actually matters. Quite a lot because if the you know the other line is team is three lines deep, then your third pairing is going to get a workout no matter what. But uh, they, I thought they responded pretty well, as you say. In that Jones, I mean, he hasn't got the kind of shot that's going to blow away a goalie from 60 feet, so he's better off getting a shot in a location where his teammate can redirect it from six feet, and that's basically what happened there. Yeah, you can be a very effective defenseman at the point without a big shot, like without a heavy shot. Uh, I mean, I mean, look at, you know, examples of really good players like like Nicholas Lidstrom, for instance. I don't believe he had a killer slap shot, but he sure could get that puck zing it on net with accuracy quickly. And um, and more than anything else, he was able to walk the line and get the puck through. So, um, yeah, you don't have to be Sheldon Surrey to to be an effective point man. Bruce, what's your bad thing? Well, I'm going to. um to uh, throw a little shade on uh, a player I really like, but uh, he had more bad outcomes than good tonight, and that was Gaetan Haas, brought back into the lineup to fill in for the injured Ryan Nugent Hopkins. And uh, Haas himself, Tippett said in the morning workout this morning that the reason that he'd missed the last game and only played five minutes in the previous game, which we had commented on, was that he'd been he'd been banged up himself in the previous game, so he he, he gave McDavid and, and others a couple of his shifts in that game, and then he gave him last night off, and he probably would have got tonight off except for he was needed. So I will I will extend him the courtesy of uh, of sharing the coach's comments to that end. Uh, but when he got out there, it wasn't really his night. He did have one really nice play. Let's start with that where he uh, uh, he stole a puck. And uh, with a little bit of help from a diligent forecheck from Dominic Cahoon, which dis- disrupted the Ottawa breakout, and they wound up trying to trying to unbalance pass, which Haas picked off, went in on 
goal and made a deacon a decent shot, but the goalie had it figured out and I uh, was able to make the save. But that was his only shot. Uh, meanwhile, he was um, uh, he took he took a penalty uh, for the Oilers that was you know didn't help the cause. Let's put it that way. They were able to kill it off, but he's one of the penalty killers, so it's a it's kind of a double whammy when the penalty killer takes a penalty. Uh, he was uh, on the one Ottawa goal, uh, and probably more bad luck than than anything else, but a bad outcome all the same. It was he who got his stick in there on the puck, on the shooter, just as he shot the puck, Connor Brown. And it was that stick on, stick on puck contact that totally, I think, fooled Smith in the Oilers' cage. And that's why a, a sort of nondescript looking shot somehow found a hole and went through Smith was that he didn't, um, he didn't get a read of the puck coming off the stick at all because it was basically coming off two sticks. Haas was trying to do his job, but he was a split second late, and like I say, the outcome was bad. So that's uh, that's where I'll mention him. And the last point, one out of eight for 13% on the face-off dot. And when you only have one right-hand stick that's available to take center uh, face-offs, he needs to be able to do better than one out of eight. Yeah. Not his best game, and maybe he was a little under the, like, you know, forced into the lineup when he's not feeling perfectly well. He Bruce played Mott. 10 minutes and 4 seconds, and that was definitely, I think, the uh, uh, the fourth line in, in this game. Well, Turris line also played 10 minutes, so. My bad thing tonight is Darnell Nurse, and I, I want to start out by talking about what he did well as, as well. Like, he was part of a really fantastic five-man unit out there that that often dominated the game and dominated in the offensive zone and he was part of that part of that group and he he's a big part of it i mean that five-man unit is starting to get exciting like hope it'd be nice to see them do this against uh some of the good teams some of the better teams that kind of domination but he's part of that and, and obviously a key part of it he is he's been playing as the number one defenseman that the orders have missed you know forever since 2017 playoffs when Oscar Clefbaum was last, I think, fully healthy. Um, that's the last time I think that the Oilers had a number one D-man, Sekera and Clefbaum that year, 2016-17. Mm. Um, but he's he's playing that role. I, I would put oh, him yeah. in, you know, I don't watch all the other defensemen in the NHL, so I can't r- actually rank him where he is. But, you know, my just my feeling, having watched the NHL, he's definitely in the number one D-man category. And he's he's probably somewhere between ten and twenty in the in the uh, ranking of where they are. Maybe a little bit higher than that. Maybe even edging into the top ten. That said, Bruce, I wouldn't like some people mention him as a Norris candidate, and and I I'm not quite there yet. And it's games like this that that give me pause because there's just all too frequent defensive breakdowns that he's still engaging in, and he and it's often he'll go for a, a he'll have some bad games. He'll have a game where he'll just Really leak a lot of grade A chances against, and this was one of them. Starts early, early in the game where Drysaddle turns over the puck in his own zone, and um, Nurse is just part of a general breakdown in his zone, um, where the puck kind of pops out front off of Smith, and there's a, a quite a dangerous chance early in the game. Didn't get better as, yeah, didn't get better as the game went along. In the third period, he just got beat on the rush. Can't remember who it was, but there was a sh- first. There was a dangerous backhand shot. Was it Paul? I think it might have been Paul. Mm-hmm. And then and there was a rebound. A, yeah. Then there was a rebound shot by Paul. He just went around Nurse. I mean, it's just yeah. how does that happen? You're Darnell Nurse. You're the biggest, baddest guy on the ice, and you're fast. How does that happen? Well, I'd say Nick Paul is pretty close to his equal in bigness and fastness. Like that was a good uh, rush, and it was a fast rush by Paul, and he used his reach to get a hard backhand, and then he won the race to rebound. And credit to Paul, but Nurse got beat. You're right. Defense has the advantage. The the next uh, next just a couple minutes later, he makes a bad pinch, and I was referencing bad pinches earlier. Tyson Berry made one in the second period where it just had me thinking, like this: the Oilers were up one nothing. What are you doing? pinching like that Tyson Berry and then nurse the same thing you know I, I you know it was a tie game then so you want to be aggressive but on the other hand that bad pinch is going to cost you and it and it and it did the the Senators came down the ice and they had a good scoring chance there was a there was an earlier 
Go ahead, Bruce. Oh, I was going to say, Bettman Point, uh, uh, Cockamamie Point system suggests uh, that uh, uh, you want to be passive aggressive in a tie yeah. game. Yeah, late. It's it's it, well, that was eight, and there was eight. What is it? Uh, nine minutes left in the game right. when he makes. No, excuse me, seven minutes, seven forty left in the game when he makes that bad pinch. So. And Jack Michaels was talking about how they were starting to boss the offensive zone like they did on the game winner last night. Uh, but Nurse is probably thinking the same thing, but his positioning got got a little slack. And when the puck got turned over, suddenly it was a two-on-one. And, and you don't really want that, obviously. Uh, then we in the in the final seconds of the game, this isn't really just him. It was a more, they all kind of got sucked into the corner away from the front of the net. Larson got sucked into the corner, which pulled McDavid, which McDavid got sucked in the corner that pulls nurse over from, from in front of that. But when you add it all up, there's Brady Kachuk at the side of the net with, with a grade A scoring chance with 17 seconds left. Probably the last guy other than that incredible sniper Stutzley, uh, Stutzel, um, the second last guy on the Ottawa centers you want with the puck there. And he, you know, he, he got off a great shot. Smith made the save, but again, that was on all of those veteran players, just not taking care of the house, getting worked up about what's going on in the corner a little bit too much. So there, there's four major mistakes by nurse on grade A chances. And some also would say his play on a two on one in the second period was, was kind of iffy where he starfished and um, the player cut across the slot. I was forgiving of Nurse because he did stop the pass, which is when you're on a two-on-one, that's your fundamental job as a defenseman is to allow the shot from the guy with the puck mm -hmm. and stop that pass. And he also slowed down the play a little bit so McDavid could catch up. And But anyway, it wasn't his best night on defense. And there's no. been a, there's been enough of this kind of night during the season that, that I, like I, I think the Norris talk is premature. It could happen, Bruce, with this guy. I think you'll get Norris votes. Yes. They do. They have, they have top five, and he'll get some votes. Uh, I don't think he's in danger of winning the Norris Trophy. Uh, in his defense, I will say this, that after playing 26 minutes and 40 seconds last night, tonight he got cut all the way down to 26 minutes and 33 seconds. Like the guy is logging a ton of ice time and he's Edmonton's best defenseman by a wide enough margin that Tippett has just thrown him over the boards, 25, 26, 27, sometimes 30 or more minutes a night. And when you have back-to-backs, I think that showed the back-to-back -back nature of this game showed on all the guys playing the big minutes. And Tippett didn't, didn't um, uh, give him any slack at all. Like uh, McDavid last night, 23 40 tonight 2356 or Dreisaitl last night 2328 tonight 2325 hey Leon you can you can have a rest tonight three seconds less than you had last night and on back to back like we have a day off in between you they they continue that pace but in the back to back and it shows a little bit on both teams and honestly David at some point in this podcast so let's make it now I really want to credit Ottawa Senators for a tremendous effort in this game they really badly wanted to beat the Oilers once this year and they were pretty unlucky not to do so they were in the nine games collectively they put up some mighty good fights in those games and tonight was maybe the best one the there's at least two games where they outchance the Oilers including tonight and tonight Smith you know he he stole the game by my definition of that of that um the one thing I'd add about Bruce, about Nurse, is that uh, sometimes I've compared him in the past to, like, what I've heard about Doug Harvey, kind of sitting in the rocking chair, sitting back, and, and adopting that style more of not taking as many chances on defense this year. Uh, it's it's funny, Bruce, I'd never seen Doug Harvey, but I last night I watched a game. There's a game from the 1959 playoffs. Toronto uh, and uh, Toronto, Toronto, Montreal in game the finals. Two. Mm -hmm. Game two, I think it is. Game and Toronto I watched, won in overtime? I watched much of the game, and I so I saw Doug Harvey play for the first right. time. Okay. And he really, it's funny, he reminded, he's doesn't, he's not like Nurse because he's a burly guy. He's a, right. he's just as, he's, you know, as big as a barrel and as big as a rain barrel. Mm -hmm. And, um, but he did remind me a little of Darnell Nurse, right. a little bit, because he, uh, 
just he suddenly all of a sudden this big birdie guy just leapt into the play and was he ever fast on the attack it surprised me and very assertive rough and assertive player as well and skilled so that yeah that was a it was interesting to see him and it was interesting to see that 19 that a game from that era because uh man was it ever slow yeah and, very uh, different eh it Chaotic. really was good yeah, you can go. Anyone can go on YouTube and watch. Call up that it's an NHL classic game, and you, anyone can watch it. It's, um, it's. I think I could only find so far like the third period on, so okay. I didn't see all the game. But um, against yeah. Toronto in the finals, fifty nine finals. Correct. Toronto win it in overtime. I believe I I, I didn't want, I don't think it had that clip either. It had the third okay. period, okay. the section that I saw. Right. Okay. So I. Correctly, should say I saw a period of the game, but it was right. it was it was fascinating viewing, and I would recommend it. Um, maybe there are the other periods there as well. My stylistic comparison for, uh, uh, and I didn't see, I only saw the very tail end of Doug Harvey's career. I think he was forty three years old when he played for St. Louis Blues in the sixty eight Stanley Cup playoffs. Uh, my stylistic, from my own experience, uh, and I'm not saying these are uh, equivalent level players. Larry Robinson. Just for his general style, big, fast, aggressive, takes chances, did lots of good things in the game, made typically a few blunders in the game, but the good outweighed the bad by a very sizable margin. Of course, he was on such a good team that when he did make a mistake, Serge Savard or Ken Dryden would make it go away most of the time. And it was, uh, but, but, uh, there were just some aspects about him and and, and and the way he talks to play that does remind me uh, of the great uh, Barry Robinson. So it's, uh, and with those high event players, I, I'm constantly on the reminder to myself, first and foremost, but also to people, there's lots of good, there's lots of bad. If you only choose one side of the equation, you're going to get an unbalanced <clears throat> view of the guy. You're going to see him either way up here as a superstar, or you're going to say, holy moly, that was a brutal turnover. Uh, I, I have a friend from, Montre from Montreal uh, of that vintage uh, who's more of an astronomy buff than he is a hockey fan. And he, he always talks about Larry Robinson as being a guy that made mistakes and made mistakes. And I'm going, holy moly, I take him on my team 10 days out of 10. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's, uh, that's the, the part of his game that soaked through on, on, my, on my friend. Uh, but uh, and some people see Darnell Nurse like that. They see the mistakes, and you see. I mean, we see them, and we we try and we try and uh, track them, uh, try and track them, and, and uh, uh, enumerate them. But we also track the good plays, and and you know, there's uh, there's been more of those than the other by a significant margin. I would I would say, mm -hmm. and not every night. And tonight was a night where. He just seemed a little sort of split second low, slow in the reacting to stuff, and that maybe it was just that back to back minutes kind of thing, and it just wasn't uh, his A game. So we've compared Darnell Nurse to Doug Harvey and Larry Robinson tonight. The the Darnell Nurse haters, if they haven't stopped watching our podcast now, by now, now is the time. So, got by guys. Thanks like, for listening, enjoyed, everyone. <laughs> through the years sticking with us to this point but we understand that oh. you can no longer come back to this podcast and listen to it and that's okay like we get it that's that's the high bar i mean i mean i could i guess i could also compare him to ed van <laughs> and stuff, right but i mean or ed it's... Jovanovsky, ed Jovanovsky. <laughs> yeah yeah well actually that's not bad yeah that, that is that style of player high event aggressive proactive tries to make things happen and one of the improvements I'm seeing in Darnell's game this year is a little bit more letting the game come to him, which is something that his critics have been saying, and they've been right for years, that he needs to do more of, and he has been doing more of it. The rocking chair. Yeah, it's well, nice. yeah. That rocking chair. The strong. In the defensive slot. Don't leave that defensive slot, Darnell, in your own zone unless you're going to win the puck. And then when you lose it, get right back there. All right. Uh Bruce, what's your number? Yeah, I guess I have to go with 9 0 and 0, which is Edmonton Oilers' record against uh, Ottawa Senators this year. 
And in the over the court, all in regulation, Ottawa from Ottawa perspective, it's not like they went 0, 06 and 3. They went 0, 09 and 0. They got no joy from any of their losses to Edmonton. They were they were beaten in regulation nine times out of nine. And in those games, the Oilers outscored the Senators 41 to 18. Uh, and they they allowed five goals in the first game. You may remember it was a really sloppy game where the Oilers had played the night before and the Senators were fresh and Stuart Skinner was the starting goalie for the Oilers playing his first and to date only NHL game. And the Sens beat him for five, but the Oilers put up eight at the other end and it was a really wide open sloppy game. After that, every game since then, the Oilers have given up two, one, two, two, one, two, two, and one goals to Ottawa. Never zero. You know, they said on the broadcast tonight, Ottawa is the only team in the NHL that has not been shut out all year, believe it or not. And the Oilers never shut them out, but they sure held them to two or less eight times in a row. So they uh, they took care of business for the most part behind their own blue line, and when they didn't, their goalies. Uh, got the job done. And Mike Smith did tonight, as Mikkel Koskinen did last night. Made the big save, even right right down to the end of the game, where it was still on the line, made the big save in the dying seconds. So, Just like tonight. They, mm-hmm. the, the saves last night were a little more alarming. Like, the Kachuk was a good shot, but the other ones, were, those were a five alarm. Yeah. yeah. The, one, the rebound was right in front last night that somehow uh, Koskinen froze. The shot that Stutzley fired into him. The three meter man. Mm-hmm. Bruce, my number is uh, related to grade A scoring chances, which we track. And in the in the first 30 games of the year, the Oilers consistently outchance the other team, usually by about two or three chat grade A chances again per two or three grade A chances per game, which is a significant number. It was like, you know. 12 to 10 or 13 to 10 on average. In the last 11 games, in which the Oilers have seven wins and um, four losses, two of those losses, uh, in they, they got loser points out of it, but seven mm-hmm. wins and four losses. So they've done well in the 11 games. Yep. But they have been outchanced on grade A chances. The opposition's been averaging 11.1 per game and the Oilers 8.3. Bruce, this is what we call, this is what I would say is unsustainable unless the Oilers keep getting this fantastic goaltending from Smith and, and, you know, Koskinen and pitching in now and then. Smith has been the story of this, of this segment of games. And it's, I'm a worried, like Nugent Hopkins is now out. Let's see what that's all about. But I'm worried about the lack of, not about the Oilers' defense so much, but their lack of attacking prowess is getting to be a little bit alarming. And um, to the, you know, Tippett's stacking it up. He's stacking it up. He's going to the obvious thing, putting McDavid and Dreisaitl together, and that worked against Ottawa. Doesn't always work against other teams, and I don't think it's going to work in the long run. So this team if it can't start generating more offense again, is not going to be going very far in the playoffs. Like they don't have that feeling. This team doesn't have that feeling to me of that kind of team right now. And it's, you know, through the first 30 games because of that scoring chance deferential, I was always positive about this team, I think, or relatively positive. And I'm not that way right now because of this. They are still winning. It's a good feeling. They've got a great, a a goalie who's playing great hockey right now. But this isn't a great, great hockey team right now. This is a team that's getting consistently outchanced, outplayed, and needs to figure it out. I don't know what they can do on their forward lines because they're getting some good play from depth players. It's really the second line where the where the issue lies. And if Nugent Hopkins is out, you know maybe they should you know call up McLeod, call up Benson, call in call in the re- uh, the replacements and see if that changes things up. Call up all three of those guys and play that line. For a couple Kyle Turris isn't doing it for you, David. Ah, yeah, he's he's not Bruce. He he he's playing a little bit better to give him some credit. But he Cassian Cassian had a bit better game too tonight. But all the way up to zero shots. Yeah, well, he had that one jam play. They he didn't tried. That yeah, out. try no, they they had two misses and one shot that was blocked. So at least he had three shot attempts tonight, which is his. Total for the entire road trip, but I, I didn't think he stunk tonight by any means. He, he had six hits and he yeah. was engaged in the game. 
but uh, shooting the puck wasn't uh, just isn't his thing, and you got to wonder about that hand, you know. That's a that's a fair comment. Hand. That's that's you being fair. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know, Bruce. What what would you like? I just think they need a second line. There's there's different things they haven't tried. I wish they would try them, but they've got to do something. And and it doesn't. But it just what frustrates frustrates me because the narrative right now from both Tippett and Holland is we've you know this is all we can do. This is all we're going to try to do. And there seems to be ob- to me at least obvious things they could try and do, but that doesn't seem to be in the cards. Well, here over those same eleven games, Mike Smith started eight of them. Uh, five, one, and two with a nine sixteen save percentage, two point six one goals against, pretty darn good in the three goal lead. Mikko Koskinen started the other three, one, two of them with a nine twenty and a two thirty four. So both goalies are 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 playing well, and and uh, both have been good since Smith got back two months ago today. Smith started in Ottawa, and the Oilers beat the Senators three to one. Go figure. And one month ago today. The Oilers beat Ottawa 3-2 to two in Edmonton, and now so they played the 8th of February, the 8th of March, the 8th of April. I bet you that doesn't happen very often in the NHL uh, lore. But anyway, it was uh, uh, the goalies uh, were a big part of this, this series win, and they've been a big part of the, of the game lately. Yeah. So they got the goaltending. They got the good. They got the good goalie heading in the playoffs. They got the two top centers. They got the number one defenseman. Um, what else are they going to do? What are they going to do? What are they going to do? So well, you know, we don't have to solve all the problems of the universe, let alone the Oilerverse, even tonight, Bruce. But um, we'll, you know, we can. We'll we'll be talking about this. Uh, maybe we'll do a. We'll probably do a podcast on Monday during the after the trade deadline, I guess. Yeah. Let's but. Do We'll see what happens. We got the game Saturday night, of course, against Calgary, right? Is that against Calgary? Yes, one, one more game in Calgary that they that they moved up on the schedule to uh, satisfy some TV commitments, and it was fairly easily done. So the orders will get will come home from this road trip. Uh, I wonder if they'll come home tonight and then go to Calgary after, but uh, with a minimum of five points in four games. And as we said before, they went on the trip that they're kind of in, in a down phase of the season, you know. And I was speculating the travel and the uh, what stuff was getting them a little bit, and that was just the dip that's to be expected. And the thing you got to do is find a way to to milk some points out of that uh, system, and they've been milking away, you know. They've seven two seven one and two in their last ten games. And it hasn't been their best hockey for several of those games, but they found a way to hang around in those games. The old Dave Tippett in Arizona style, some of those games. You know, tonight, yeah, I, how many games do we see Dave Tippett beat the Oilers? Exact same way he beat yeah. the Ottawa Senators tonight. One to one, and you're dominating play, and you can't score, and you, you know, you're all over them, and then they got a uh, 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 one decent possession in your end, and wouldn't you know it, some guy you never heard of before has just tipped one home, and it's, uh, you know, Jordan Martinuk or somebody who says, uh, has popped one home and it's five minutes left, and you're down a goal, and there's big Mike Smith at the other end, and you're never going to get that tying goal past that big guy, and that, that was the exact formula for Arizona. Remember 25 games in a row, the Oilers never beat him once in regulation? That's <laughs> reminding me, Bruce. Well, yeah. he's on our side now, so I'm kind of <laughs> smiling at the moment. I mean, I'd rather win ugly than than not, and that was kind of what tonight was. And uh, they hung around and they found a way to win it. So let's give some credit where due. And that is a, that's a fair comment because you know, in the past, it's way better to lose. You know, in these last eleven games, what did it, way better to be seven wins and four losses than four wins and seven losses like they would have been in the past going through a stretch like this. Mike's, you know, the goaltending really has been good. And sometimes teams can win on goaltending for a while. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's part of hockey as well. So, and, you know, Mike Smith shows no signs of slowing down right now. He's just on the, he's on a heater. And if if he stays healthy, it's it's looking good for the, for the big man come playoff time. I saw one sign tonight, and 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 he was well aware of it. And that was his puck handling game was down a couple of courts. Uh, he uh, he flicked one puck over the glass, first penalty of the year. I'm pretty sure that he got for missing. Usually he hits the glass about this far above the top, and this one he cleared it by 
less than that, but he cleared it. Uh, another time where he coughed the puck up and behind the net and he had to poke check a guy or it would have been an open net goal. And three official giveaways to li- lead the team where, you know, he passed it, but he didn't pass it to Moyer. And usually he's pretty precise on that. And he was, you could tell he was a little frustrated with himself. Uh, and you could also tell that the, his teammates badly wanted to kill that penalty. And that penalty kill was a clinic. The two minutes after Smith cleared the puck over the glass, his teammates picked him up the way he's picked them up a lot of times. And it was that was really, uh, I really enjoyed watching that penalty kill. That was a outstanding effort. Alrighty then. Well, it's Kurt who's doing the game grades tonight, so we can take it easy a little bit after this. Back and relax. 41 games, David, 25 wins. So you could kick that over an 82-game season. That's 50 wins and 104 points is, uh, is what it prorates to. That is a good hockey team that posts a record like that. This is a good hockey team. And, uh, you know, I hope they, they can figure out the, in terms of ramping up that attack again, overall attack again. Part of it is due to less fewer power plays, too, it's fair to say. One, so, one but, tonight. I wonder if Nuge is out, one, one most nights. I wonder if Nuge is out, if we will see Ryan McLeod get called up or Benson or both. I, I, um, I'd i be itching to see that, like uh, inject a little uh, life into this lineup and see how it goes. Not that the not that the people are playing poorly. Of course, they're not playing well. No, I'll give you the flip side of what I just said. Tonight they played their ninth and last game against the Ottawa Senators. You wouldn't normally expect nine more games in the second half of your imaginary 82 game season and they're nine and zero against ottawa against the rest of the teams they're 16 14 and 2 or put another way 16 wins 16 losses their plus 19 goal differential melts away to minus four and they're right in the middle of that whole pack of the other six teams so to make progress in the playoffs they're going to have to start beating those teams and they might as well start beating them before the playoffs, but they they've got uh, uh, they've they've still got plenty of work to do. Let's uh, let's put it that way. Yeah, I mean, in bringing up the negative scoring chance differential, I'm kind of in my mind referencing what Holland was saying earlier this week. Oilers Jim Ken Holland mm-hmm. talking about the need to like you want to make the playoffs, you want to give yourself a chance, and you want to head into the playoffs playing good hockey. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what I'm worried about. I don't think this team is firing on all cylinders not even close to it they're gradually maybe working out some of the issues on defense getting some pairings at work um but you got to they've got to attack better they've got to get more out of everybody on the attack except for maybe connor mcdavid and dry who are giving quite a bit already but it, they've got to maximize everything and they're not maximizing now they're kind of i feel minimizing it so um, that's that's how you end up with so few grade A chances each game. All right, Bruce, we'll talk Saturday night. Thanks for talking yeah. tonight. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.